Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last of three roundtables organized for the initiative known as Proposals for Novel Ways of Being. My name is Lucas, and I work in the Curatorial Programs team of National Gallery Singapore. The speakers we have today are some of the program partners and collaborators of the Novel Ways Initiative, and we will be get, hoping to get their thoughts on the impact of the pandemic on what they do, but also what art and culture can, has been doing, or will want to do in response. Before I introduce the speakers, allow me to say a little about the initiative. Proposals for Novel Ways of Being is an initiative co-developed by National Gallery Singapore and Singapore Arts Museum, who are joined by 10 other local art institutions, art spaces, and artists collected to create a series of exhibitions and programs specifically in response to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Singapore and its art ecosystem. By creating platforms for curatorial and artistic projects, which run from August 2020 to February this year, Novel Ways aims to work in solidarity to rally or otherwise concentrate the efforts of the Singapore art community so that all our audiences will have something to look forward to as we exit uh, Circuit Breaker and its various stages. A key aim for the initiative is to be able to provide some support for artists and other cultural workers. So this support comes in a form of remuneration for participation, space to work, as well as other organizational and less tangible support. In our last count, the initiative involves more than 170 cultural workers, art movers, programmers, and uh, this is of course not counting the sort of multiplier effects or trickle down effect for other people uh, on the periphery, like your video editors, etc. Institutions like the Gallery, SAM, and NTU ADM Gallery were asked to go a bit further and engage external curators to work on their projects rather than just look in house. In the title, Proposals for Novel Ways of Being, makes a deliberate reference to the name of the virus causing COVID 19. For us, it is a reminder that, is, that this is, in a sense, just a new virus and a new crisis. There will be other viruses and other crises. It is just a way to recognize that the turmoil caused by the pandemic is both unprecedented, but also not. And that perhaps there are lessons to be drawn from the past and lessons to be drawn from this crisis for the future. And importantly, the initiative demonstrates a belief in the essentialness of art and artists and their role in reflecting the conditions and anxieties of our time, as well as to imagine and propose ways to rethink our relationship to the structures of the world order to be these uh, economic or sociopolitical to nature uh, and also to the communities that we're part of. So please go to novelwaysofbeing.sg to find out more about the programs uh, by the 12 program partners and also for information and recordings of programs organized in conjunction like this round table. And with that, uh, I now invite our speakers to turn on their cameras and microphones. And I'll introduce them. We have with us Yurik Lau, founding member of uh, Art Collective Intermission. We have Federico Roberto, co-founder of the research agency, amongst other things, Form Axioms. We have Chris Fassner, founder of the multidisciplinary studio, Tropical Futures Institute uh, in Cebu, the Philippines. And we have Kathleen Bitzig and Carlos Quijon Jr., co-curators of In Our Best Interests, presented by the EDM Gallery at the Nanyang Technological University. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for Hi. making the time today. So on to the round table proper. Uh, so this is not a show and tell where people come with PowerPoint presentations and whatnot. Uh, rather, I will just pose a few questions to our speakers uh, about their respective novel waste projects and take it from there. Uh, all these members too, please note that there is time for questions and answers. So at any point, please send in your questions uh, in the comment section on Facebook. And our dear speakers, uh, you're encouraged to ask questions of one another. So feel free to interrupt or interject. To get us started, uh, I have a question to pose to all our speakers. So in my very long spiel at the beginning, I suggested that proposals for novel ways of being hopes to imagine and solicit new ways of constructing our future. So this may or may not uh, be an unreasonably hopeful position to, position to take. But because we're at the beginning of 2021, perhaps I could have you introduce yourself in short, 
uh, round robin style and just to say a few sentences you know to tell us where you're speaking from today uh, how how you're feeling how hopeful you are about the future anyone okay you're it so so maybe i'll start <laughs> So hi everyone. Right now, uh, I'm in the office. I'm in La Salle. So I think as being uh, rested for quite a while, and I think this year we started off quite strongly, I believe. And yeah, work has been rolling. So yeah, I just, I just came came back from some meetings. So I think work will never stop. And I'm assuming they were good meetings. <laughs> Okay, uh, I guess I'll go around uh, to my right. My right is Carlos. Hi, Carlos. Tell us where you're hi. from today. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carlos Tung Jr. I'm an architect and creator. I'm in Manila. Um, yeah, just taking it day by day, I guess. Oh, sorry. I, I, I thought I lost you there for a second, taking it day by day. Okay. Mm. And Kat, Kat Dinsey. Hi, everyone. I'm Kat or Kathleen. Um, I'm in Singapore too. Uh, I think we've been pretty privileged in Singapore, so I'm pretty hopeful for the future. <laughs> but also, I think that in relation to the projects that we're all presenting today or speaking to, mm. I think um, COVID-19 has been a really interesting opportunity of thinking through what solidarity is, what it means to be an ally across national borders, but also what it means, um, what it means to think beyond oneself and one's situation um, in, in, at the time of a global pandemic. Yeah. Thank you for All that. Right. Thanks so much for having us, Lucas. No, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking time, all of you. Federico, how are you? Hi. Yeah, uh, my name is Federico. I'm also based in Singapore. Uh, I'm, I've been doing uh, research in teaching and writing. And I think like mostly what this time is allow me is, has allowed me to do or to force me to do is to sort of uh, reflect enough on alternative modes of writing or alternative practice of writing. At the same time, maybe looking at how, yeah, our desire are sort of mutating in a uh, strange manner. So I don't want to sound like uh, the one that kind of takes more space than others. So I will say just this. I just trying to figure out ways in which maybe we can sort of re-sync, reconnect, <clears throat> and finding maybe new cognitive potential in, uh, in spaces that are not necessarily material. And I think that's what we try to do with our project. We'll see more li uh, about it later on, yeah. I hope. Yeah. Next, we have Chris Fastner. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm zooming in from, uh, from Rome right now. Uh, I was in Singapore actually earlier this year before uh, the border lockdown. And before that, I've been living out of the Philippines for Cebu Philippines for the last two and a half years or so. Uh, I'm doing okay. I think I'm just being more this, this pandemic, just sort of, you know, just being more in touch with darkness really. And, uh, you know, shadow, uh, more in touch with like, how would you, you know, the black side, I guess, of the yin and yang uh, part of it. Um, in term, you know, uh, in terms of like, op, like, what do I see about, or what do I feel about the future? Uh, it's pretty, it feels really dystopic. Um, yeah, you know, especially when I look at Singapore in contrast with other parts of the world, um, you know, I won't say too much, but it just, uh, yeah, it's like a sci-fi. <laughs> You know, especially when I was leaving Singapore, uh, as I left T1, uh, I thought I was, I felt like I was in like a movie or something. Um, like it was all dark, no, no one was there. And um, as, you know, as I left the green zone and um, when I entered the immigration in Italy, the, the guy was like, why are you coming here from Singapore? And I was like, well, I'm here to see my partner. And he was like, 
well, welcome to the jungle. And then, you know, it was, you know, and I think that sort of distinction is going to continue to uh, be more and more apparent as uh, time goes by. Thank you, uh, all our speakers. But actually, you know, since when you look at the yin and yang, and it's your, I guess to me, it suggests that we all are rather hopeful about the future since uh, we're, we're seeing that in calamity, there are, uh, I guess, ways to turn it to, into a positive. And th the reason why I had asked you about how you're feeling, uh, it's because uh, we, I, I noticed that when both of these projects that uh, you are working on for Novel Ways, uh, both of them have a speculative approach, you know, both to the past and for, uh, uh, in terms of archiving artistic output or geopolitical positioning. And, and you do that in order to create uh, for and constantly, I guess, a uh, brighter, better future. So uh, it's in that context, I was hoping we could invite you to speak to us about how your project responds to the concerns of novel ways. And perhaps also in doing that, to talk about the potential of uh, speculation or speculative narratives. Uh, maybe I would give that to Carlos and Kathleen to start. Oh. Sorry, here. Carlos, you go ahead first. I just fixed my mic. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, I think for the exhibition and the research project that we um, planned, and which is opening on the 22nd, actually, at the NTU ABM Gallery, um, I think central for me personally is the idea of solidarity, just like Kath mentioned, uh, but not just the aspirational side of it, but also the limits of solidarity and the persistence of these aspirations. I think um, these are important um, in imagining a future, um, as you said, Lucas, mm -hmm. um, because it makes us more sensitive to how political conditions um, uh, are happening and how we can respond more sensitively to these um, political conditions, especially in the contemporary moment. So I guess um, in that sense, uh, speculation for me allows us to um, be mindful of the simultaneity of this, the limits and also the persistence mm -hmm. and the aspirational quality of um, solidarity. What I would maybe add, I mean, Carlos is so eloquent, one can almost not top that, that type of answer. <laughs> but what I would um, add to compliment is because Carlos and I have been working on this research, I would say for two years now, right, Carlos? It's been, mm -hmm. and it's been a long time coming. But it's also that what happened with COVID was it brought a lot of the, a lot of the issues and a lot of the speculation that we were, sort of speculative histories we were mining um, gained a certain type of urgency. I don't, um, given how, how much information factors into your show for the rest of the panel, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Peter Turchin's work. He's been getting a lot of um, popular references recently in the Atlantic, Guardian, whatever. But anyway, he's a data scientist who has sort of churned a hundred thousand years of, or of human history and ha actually predicted that 2020 would be a, a year of social crisis and that we go in 50 years of um, 50 year cycles and that and he drew parallels to the 50s and 60s which is actually the period that Carlos and I are speculating on. So there's also a particular urgency to look into history especially as we're in a moment which seems mm -hmm. unprecedented which it is to it is Mm -hmm. um, but in these kinds of moments, the social fractures that come up aren't unprecedented, yeah. right? Yeah. And so um, there's opportunity here to talk to, the, to, to those histories, but also to talk to the contemporary, because the contemporary is almost an imprint of the historical maps that are left behind. It's just finding those maps, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so this is what I would sort of add to Carlos's amazing <laughs> like very and succinct encapsulation of this very long research project we've been doing. And the project is called In Our Best Interests. Our audience member can see 
uh, I think the link on Facebook. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, the exhibition is called In Our Best Interest, um, Afro-Southeast Asian Affinities During a, a Cold War. And it's a long-term research project that Carlos and I are working on. So the first moment is actually happening in Singapore like Carlos said, on, on the 22nd of January, and then it subsequently travels to Manila later, and then on to Korea. And it's a project that is, a research project actually developed with Connect ASEAN, in partnership with Connect ASEAN. Um, so that, in a sense, is associated also with the Republic of Korea. So, you know, we can talk about that later. Um, but the making of the project also is a certain type of imagination of contemporary solidarities, right, that are not bound to specific nation states or specific geographies. Mm -hmm. I'm always excited about uh, inter-Asia collaborations personally. Do you think, uh, what was the response when uh, you, we first, you first approached Connect ASEAN with this project and with your overseas collaborators? Because when you're, it's traveling to the Vargas Museum, I think, in Manila and somewhere in South Korea, like, uh, it was, it was there like a great interest in looking at uh, inter-Asia collaborations and history? Carlos, why don't you talk a little bit about, sorry, not to direct, but Carlos actually was the one who set up a lot of the Philippine connections. Oh. Um, and, you know, with any independent project, a lot of it is different moments of a collaborative team working together. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to speak about that first, and then we can collectively respond to the ASEAN thing. Sure. Um, I think primarily, because the, the exhibition um, looks at the, the Afro-Asian history and legacy by way of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in, in this case, it's a, it's a specific iteration in 1963 um, uh, titled, uh, called Mafilindo. It's a confederation between among Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia, formed in 1963. Um, so I guess one, one of the major reasons why we wanted it to travel to Manila is because of that um, historical, um, already historical fact that this happened in 1963. Um, and I guess the connection with the relationship with ASEAN um, comes naturally because we were also um, expanding the research into other iterations of Southeast Asia, like ASEAN. Um, right. So I guess the connections were there and uh, um, it just so happened that um, Connect ASEAN expressed interest. Mm -hmm. Kat, uh, do you have more to add on to that? Or? Oh, no, I mean, again, <laughs> Carlos very succinctly captured Stop it. Stop it, Carlos. <laughs> But I guess the only thing I would say is that, um, you know, uh, Connect ASEAN and ASEAN in general, I mean, if we look at ASEAN historically in terms of its cultural production, has really been invested in terms of mining its own history and also mm -hmm. what that, that kind of geopolitical community could mean. So mm -hmm. um, they've really been involved with this. And this is where I have to actually um, thank Ben Ham, who's currently, I think they're their main consultant, I apologize for his exact mm. title, but he became very interested in the research that we were doing and started talking to us very early on. And so uh -huh. in a sense, um, he's even helped with some of the research um, through the ASEAN uh, Foundation and, and things of the sort. So it's, a, it's really a research project um, in partnership, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we, we, uh, at the National Gallery, we had some contact with uh, Ben also working on something else and he's very ready to be supporting research that complicates uh, the history or, or, or the way culture and arts uh, is viewed in the region, which uh, is really commendable. Thanks, Ben, if you're, if you're, if you're listening in. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ben. <laughs> and if we're looking, uh, back at uh, history in, in a way, uh, this also brings us to the project that's um, Intermissions in Other Ways project called Negantropic Fields. Um, and perhaps Yurik uh, Federico would like to introduce a little bit of that project and tell us how it relates to Novel Ways. Mm. Well, um, okay. Maybe I, I give a, a, a brief intro then Federico, please help me on it. <laughs> I think when we first started this project, uh, we are also in the midst of transition. The, uh, 
when we are facing the circuit breaker time and some of our overseas trip and projects have to postpone or either turn it to an online event. Mm -hmm. And we, we also did a few online events and shows before this project. And I think when we got the opportunity to rethink about exhibition and what is online, what is digital uh, art or even digital platform for the arts and even how artists work in, the, in this digital realm. I think we, it set us thinking about this whole platform and how to engage uh, with audience, with the artwork and even as a space and how do we define space. So with uh, Form Axioms as our co-curator, we uh, embarked on a bit more ambitiously. We also invited five other overseas responder slash creator dash artist teams uh, because they are often our overseas collaborator as well. So we want to keep the connection going mm. and because we cannot, we cannot go overseas to them and they can't come back here. So I think having this platform to to uh, to have this connection, uh, just keep on going. Even even we can't fly, but we are still working together. And and together with the Singapore artists, we we kind of you know we, we try to rethink. Yeah, what is exhibition? Are we still doing exhibition? What's the point? And uh, if we're doing exhibition, then how is it going to be like in the digital world? Mm -hmm. And how are artists' life and working methods are affected? even for media artists. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't mean that media artists just use a computer and everything is fine. Actually, we, we need a lot of connection. We need, we need, we need to travel. We need to uh, go to places, you know, and it definitely affected even media artists. So Negatropic Fields, the title suggests a way of bonding or more social or global cohes cohesiveness, not, not breaking down. Because when we try to find out you know, what name suggests this kind of bonding, yeah, it suggests that it is the opposite of entropy, which yeah. is breaking apart. So this is this is bonding together. Yeah. It's a beautiful title. Please. Yeah, uh, I will add maybe onto a little bit of the concern or background sort of uh, reflection that sort of fuel our initial <clears throat> brainstorming. And I think like uh, working within the pandemic uh, made us reflect on something that was already going on before the pandemic. It's just that the pandemic exacerbated uh, a process of uh, fractalization <clears throat> of uh, presence, meaning. And there, there is a sort of, uh, in a, uh, encompassing kind of sense of loss of agency or action, which we tie back to trying to find practices to to look at at the future and and, and at the past in a in a critical manner. Which I think this this part connects a bit with what you were saying before, like a speculative future. What why the, the term speculative speculative emerge not only in novel ways but uh, uh, is, is, has become now a, a general sort of a vector of uh, supposedly emancipation or a vector of expanding out of what seems to be an, ex in an, 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 um, an unsurpassable sort of uh, stasis. No? So for us was uh, the, the, the exhibition like in Tropic, as Eric said, <clears throat> a reaction, uh, it was a construction of uh, fields of sense fields that maintain a community alive in time, given that the community could be an artistic community or any sort of community. I think the project so was aiming at uh, finding tools and spaces, digital and physical spaces for a grounding future community or future form of life. So I think, yeah, uh, it to, it's twofold. It has a speculative component, it's a spe speculative projection of new form of space and form of presences, mm -hmm. which is what you can see at the National Gallery mm -hmm. <clears throat> by entering this sort of multi-level interactive environment we, we design together with the artist. At the same time though, by, we start like that actually, reflecting on uh, speculative future creation of alternative uh, 
dimension of presence and collaboration. But immediately after a couple of weeks, we realized that uh, it would have fallen short as a, as a critical project without the constitution of a platform. A platform as a space for maintaining a form of sense in time for such community. So mm. our, the second part was about the critical reflection on the art and the act of collection and transformation in the digital. So it became like a, almost like a, a project of uh, exposing the art of curating or new form of creation. Like let's say, so there are these two companies, there is the digital platform online and there is the physical, like the hybrid sort of uh, physical and digital extension of the gallery. So yeah, <clears throat> at the end, the platform became a, a prototype uh, to, to test archival possibilities in the context of uh, new emerging digital modes of uh, production, consumption, expression, and form of being. Well, yes, it's true. The project uh, in this presentation is quite self-reflective uh, mm. about the processness of it all. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 uh, it wants to expose basically that it uh, in in blatant kind of uh, term that art is uh, art or any process of transformation of a of of uh, of a given situation requires a collectivity is a collective endeavor. So the mm. platform exposed the inner working and the relationship between all the fragments that gets produced and accumulated in time and gets in correlation with each other. So it exposes that both for the for the community, the in, internal community that is working within the platform and mm -hmm. for the external community that is the public at large. So that art becomes not anymore like the witnessing or of a one off object of uh, materialization or a product of or a or a screen presentation or a sound performance but he has uh, basically each project has a myriad of of components that are in correlation so it becomes like a series of um, uh, digital accumulation in time that concretize and form a concept at the end of the day right so we have uh in this round table also chris fastner from tropical futures institute uh one of the collaborators for negatropic fields. And I was thinking maybe we could have Chris speak a little bit about your involvement in the project and uh, in response to what Federico and Eurek were sharing. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, the invitation was um, awesome. And um, actually what Eurek was saying, it, it, it was cool. It, it definitely created a new community around me, or I guess I would say reignited a community in terms of me reaching out to uh, Sebastian and Thierry of Morikana. Um, and yeah, I, I think the initial premise uh, of the show, like, you know, like it definitely the idea of the metaverse, the idea of, um, you know, the idea of scale within the metaverse um, and this sort of different, uh, I guess, I would, you know, I would say like the actual instance and, uh, manifestation of the exhibition is, is definitely represents a trend that we're heading towards in terms of like having digital objects or like physical objects manifesting in a digital within this sort of environment. Um, in, in the particular case of Morikana, um, you know, the, the, the way that we responded, you know, like when I was talking with them, they had they had been working on a piece that was dealing with scale on the microscopic or, you know, on, yeah, on the microbial level. Um, and then that was sort of, that was a network performance. If you saw the, the piece, it's basically them jamming out with uh, these, uh, these uh, little microbes or, you know, and it, you know, in a lot of ways it has a literal, literal representation to the, the current situation. Uh, mm -hmm. But also I, I think, you know, it does, um, speak towards, uh, you know, on a positive, positive note, you know, um, not all dark, uh, it, it does like, uh, make us aware of scales of ecology in terms of how we can interact with our space. And, and I thought this was sort of, it matched perfectly with the, how Neg and Tropics and the Novel Ways exhibitions were setting up. Um, and the performance itself, like when you see it, 
it reveals or unpacks, um, you know, just the same way that this sort of subspecies, uh, you know, virus unpacks the scale around us, you know, we, mm. we become aware. Um, and, you know, and then you can also look at it in the inverse way, um, you know, you know, not digital or microscopic, but in terms of, uh, you know, ecosystemic perspective, um, it, it, it makes aware of how small we are as well, I think, too. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I, yes, I, I, I did see the, the, the video by Morakana. It's quite mesmerizing. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty insane when you think like, uh, you know, the, the layers of technology and then the, the different collaborators, although I don't know how willing the microbes are, but, you know, uh, <laughs> they're there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's definitely an uh, interesting uh, experience. And I mean, uh, yeah, I, I guess like the other thing is just, you know, speaking towards the literal manifestation of the, the digital spaces, you know, hopefully in a in a future instance, uh, Federico, we can we'll be able to to embed something. But the the idea of like uh, seeing you know seeing things in the VR, I, I think will become more and more apparent, uh, more and more like part of our digital sort of uh, consumption. It just you know at this at this time I think something even though VR is talked about so much it, it it's just like it's so early, and you know maybe when we're more boomerish, uh, we'll like we'll be you know we'll be interfacing with with headsets rather than actual PCs and stuff and then that's when you see like this sort of um, adaptation into this sort of um, you know digital manifestation of, of, um, of work or art and that sort of transition over. It was great that you brought that up because uh, I, I understand that uh, after the exhibition at the gallery uh, ends in February, the project continues. Uh, it takes on uh, various afterlife. Yeah, <clears throat> it, uh, we are yeah, actively now uh, collecting uh, different theoretical fragments that will be uh, uh, expanding the field of the plot with different kind of uh, take on, on the future of art, media art, uh, mm. uh, politics and agency in art, uh, or more formal question about processes of, uh, of formal processes versus analog processes and the sort of uh, contingent sort of connection between the two. So different different take will start appearing, and then at the same time we'll be starting to test out this sort of integration that uh, Chris was uh, hinting at. Because mm -hmm. I think if I may add to what Chris was saying, uh, to me the beauty of of, of uh, the, the sublime in in Morakana's performance was um, everything that Chris said. But <laughs> I will add from uh, uh, I think due to my let's say, philosophical reading of it is the fact that they managed to, to create a, 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 a knot, a sort of a momentary kind of connection between a, a formal system that are computationally set. So they're numerically and digitally sort of conceived in which uh, clearly the possibility of, of the event that escape the norm, it's, it's, a different, it's of a different kind from a physical uh, happening or events. And in fact, the biological sort of uh, entity that are swarming in their sort of um, sampled water. And there is this duality between a purely formal system and a purely uh, unbridled kind of unconstrained sort of organism. And there is in between in the space of the performance in which that sort of uh, virtuosity emerged. So I think they managed to create that event that generate true novelty by putting the two system in connection. I think that's the future of sort of, of or art at large should look at finding sort of moments of knitting or connecting formal and analog system in, in creative manner, like to, to, to remain brief, but yeah. And I think, yeah, the potential of what Chris was hinting at is that maybe to bring back that not necessarily only to look at it in a, in a virtual, in a VR environment, but 
having the user in the digital, in the virtual world at the gallery, potentially moving themselves, their own body at the scale of the microbe and interacting with the biological system. So transforming, not directly influencing the, the, the sort of monocellular organism, clearly, but the mapping of the organism that has been translated into a virtual environment at the same time has become like a digital entity, a, a, a kind of a, a formal entity. At, at the same time, also the presence of the audience is being translated by a Kinect capture into a, a sort of virtual presence. And potentially that can be uh, augment, not just purely the experience of the user, but augment the performance itself by generating even more variation. Mm. Thank you for that. Because uh, this really brings me to one of the questions I was going to ask uh, um, all our speakers was, uh, you know, uh, in, there's so much talk about adapting to the new normal, but uh, from uh, as artists or as uh, uh, curatorial practitioners, are you already seeing that artists are rethinking their practices or their presentation of their artworks? Uh, or are we actually all in a way uh, waiting for uh, the pandemic to be over, you know, uh, whenever that is, you know, when the vaccine is here and whatnot, to go back to the way things were. Like how much uh, true, I guess, uh, proliferation of uh, experimentation uh, are we seeing? Or is it too early to say? Um, if I may, like, I, I would say, because I do work with several performing artists, um, I think that's really been one of the hardest hit sectors, uh, you know, dancers, musicians, uh, performing artists. And mm -hmm. um, so the adaptation is already taking place. Um, you know, Morikana, for example, uh, Tiri herself is a performance artist and she does also work with dancers. So there, uh, you know, the, the, the work that was shown in Novel Ways was already adaptation um, to that. Friends in New York, for example, my friend, he has a dance company. Mm -hmm. They've had to create uh, COVID, you know, they're still performing, but the, the the scale of performance has shifted where it's, you know, I'm sure you've seen all the videos of the orchestras performing for like three people or something like that, but it's like a super short segment. So my, my friend's doing that over there. Like on on other on other levels though, like it's definitely hard for some of my friends that are performing musicians, um, because uh, that that's it's so hard to uh, for me at least I'm having a hard time seeing how that manifests and how that sort of economic model can be revived where uh, those sort of uh, cultural you know workers are remuner remunerated because like. Know, how many streams or OVRs can we really go to, or you know, are, are we really going to be donating money to a radio station? So there, there, I, I do think it, it is adapting, but um, I don't know. There's there's always something about being in person at a at a performance or a zine fest or a concert or sweating in a club. You know, it's just um, yeah. Any responses? So maybe I can add to Chris's uh, response. Uh, yeah, I, I do find that um, I think we, we, we can't really say that it's the new normal. I think this, this, this term is also not very clear. And I think it, it, yeah. it's, it's sort of uh, engages us as artists in a totally different way, artists and creator. And um, even, even when we were doing the show with Murakana, doing the live events. Mm -hmm. And even though we are all uh, have worked with our equipment and know how to use broadcasts and know how to use streaming systems, somehow in the background, there is little chaos that audiences don't see. And often we are always using new ways and old ways just to get things, to, to get things done. And apart from that, it's, it is, it's still a physical and virtual performance because it is really objects, material, elements, real things that we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. But we are translating these elements into a virtual state in a, in, a, in, a, in a digital platform for a digital audience. And it can be archived there forever. Mm -hmm. So we are working in both, you know, uh, and a very... Uh, immediate 
circumstances in the physical sense, but also in the in the digital part. So so it became like uh, artists. I think all over has to. I don't know. It's maybe in a not a very nice way to say, but get used to the way of working now. Uh, we have we often we have used technology in our works, but I think this is like a booster. Uh, sorry for the vaccine pun, but it's it's like a booster to to engage with technology even further. Yeah. Um, to briefly add to this, I think there. Sh I hope nobody is looking for a return to that normality that we left somehow uh, for different reasons. Of course, we are all missing uh, physical presence, uh, that sort of uh, enchanting sort of uh, empathy that you, you manage to generate by connecting to a performer, by connecting to a public face to face. But there were clear uh, sort of shortcoming, maybe, of the model at large, not only in the art world, but in, in general. <clears throat> shortcoming and limitation that uh, by living through the pandemic time, we have potentially kind of, uh, we potentially proper, probably managed to map with a bit more depth. And that happened not only in the art world. So I hope that art sort of as a system that happened to be placed within what uh, uh, theorists such as uh, Benjamin Bratton call uh, planetary scale computation. Art itself cannot be anymore dwell on that sort of uh, not so well performing uh, past somehow. So it's the chances to look at not to delete the past, but to sort of uh, reboot it in a, in a different way. Which means that at large, the public, if, if, if one wants to think of a possibility of change, that I think that's the true role or true aim of any artistic practice, is to become a little bit more literate in, 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 in let's say, not technical, but digital system. Because any form of creation is reformatted by zero and one. So any form of creation is re, retranslated into dig, in, in, in different uh, form of expression, willingly or not. So somehow it is up to the, for, for any artistic practice to discover novel form of translation. I don't think maybe it's too early to look at what artistic, artistic, artistic practices are doing. What we try to do, we took the chance ourselves in this, in this, uh, in this exhibition to, to test uh, alternative form of, uh, of mm. let's say, connection. Well, uh, I hope that Carlos and Kat will, will also respond to that question, but uh, because uh, Federico was using, you know, uh, metaphors about rebooting uh, and it, it of course brings to mind uh, these words like glitch or breakdown or disruption that have been used to describe what's happening right now, you know, uh, with, the, the, with the pandemic on the world. But perhaps we might, might uh, we may be better served by Yurik's language, the idea of like a boosting of like addressing it, instead of restarting uh, the system, which we can't because we're all part of it. And how do we, uh, I guess, adjust or, or address uh, the, the failing uh, components, you know, to boost it, to augment it, to, to tweak it in that sense. So this is just, uh, it's a long way of, say, uh, of asking actually what you think uh, arts and culture artists, uh, what they should play in addressing the, the, some, some of the issues and problems that we face as, 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 as a world, uh, as a planet. Um, Carlos, I don't know whether you want us to jump, uh, or Lucas, you want Carlos and I to jump yes, in? Yes, 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 please do. <laughs> um, okay, so like, first, I, I'm gonna work backwards and just respond, since you, you posed this question first about the role that, um, artists, curators play in light of a post-COVID-19 mm. uh, situation. And I think I agree with pretty much everyone else on the panel that there is no going back, right? Like this idea of a return to a pre-COVID normalcy is just like fantasy. Um, and I think that on a certain level, so that, that's, let's just plug that there. 
But I wonder on a certain level whether COVID and the social factors that go along with COVID, um, and I go back to um, what I was saying about what that data scientist Turnchin had said or implies is that really what we've seen is a symptom of, a, of, a, of the systemic, of what has been just the propulsion of history anyway because of the systems that we have. And that really, if you want to talk about a glitch in capitalism or a glitch, whatever, um, I don't know. I think the distance that we've had as of in terms of sitting in 2021, and that's not much difference, is that we've seen in the early years, early days of COVID, we thought, oh, this is the end of global capitalism. There's a way we can rewrite the system. But when we look at today, the top 1% has profiteered off of COVID-19 more. So, and there's an unequal imbalance in terms of resources and capital. I mean, it's just the system sort of re, well, not so much a reboot, but it's just a system continuing on its um, on its wheels. And the question then becomes where, where, what is the role then do we play in this? If the COVID is COVID-19 and the global pandemic, a hard reality for people to suddenly realize, okay, this is an opportunity that we realize the system that we've worked on doesn't work. And the rolling of history as it is needs a correction. And this is something where we actively have to put ourselves into the role of um, working towards those corrections. So this is a very different idea than glitching, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's saying that, it's admitting that the system isn't a glitch <clears throat> and that mm -hmm. what we're seeing is something that we, we can speak to. And I, and I think, Carlos, I don't wanna speak for both of us, but I do think from our discussions over the last two years, part of the logics of the show is, and in going back to the historical and to understand with, as a way of understanding the contemporary, not just COVID, because mind you, this project that Carlos and I um, was developing came about before COVID. We were already mm -hmm. having discussions. It's mm -hmm. just COVID kind of um, put it on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and kind of pu push, push some of the urgency around the research that we were doing to us that we felt like, okay, it's time to make an exhibition. It's time to to, to really um, create a physical space for this rather than write essays and just talk and, you know, mm -hmm. um, which I think says a lot, right? Um, and goes back to the whole physicality thing. So, um, so in the indirect way of answering your question is that I do think that in a sense, the role that we do play as artists, as curators, as cultural producers is we're kind of like, the space to intellectually think through a moment, which is a collective global crisis. Because what mm -hmm. happens at crisis? Crisis is the moment, it's the moment the state goes into survival mode, the moment borders start coming up, the mm -hmm. moment it becomes, do I have enough masks? Do I have enough um, vaccines? What happens when the vaccine doesn't work? You know, like, and we then start thinking within very national paradigms, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but then the fractures of that start to come up because families are not national, for example. Like we all have family that's all around the world. We live, we've lived in a hyper-globalized world for hundreds of years in different forms, right? We'd like to believe it's only very recent, but it's not, you know? Um, and so in a sense, like what we can kind of do as artists and thinkers and uh, curators and in terms of just in cultural production is that we can start to think about the things that are happening and create a kind of discourse. Now you can talk about this as therapy on some level that it can be a type of comfort, right? We can provide hope, but we can also provide a critical reflection to be like, okay, beyond the languages of hope, beyond the idealism of coming together, mm -hmm. what are actually the stakes here? And what are the languages that we've used in the past and that we're using now, how is it different? Are we just, churning the system on again or are we thinking of new ways actually okay so i'm gonna yeah. stop there but the only other thing i wanted to add maybe and Car so that carlos can at least speak i'm sorry carlos sure, you know, sure. we, get we, we get riled up about this when we talk right and then you can't <laughs> you can't keep us quiet but one of the things that um what i enjoyed the rest of the panel talking about was this idea of objecthood and this sort of turn in the art world that you see af after covid in terms of um, the care that goes into objects, but also the comfort that comes in objects, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the sort of tactile. And one of the things that was very interesting about this is I think our relationship to the object is going to change. And I'm not just talking about digital technologies, whatever. I mean, even digital technologies have material infrastructures that have objectness to them mm -hmm. that we yeah. at times, right? Um, but 
I'm just, I'll just tell this little anecdote. When we were preparing for this exhibition, Carlos and I hunted down this book, Philippines Turns East, and we found a copy that was signed by Maka Pagal, the then president, and we're like, oh, this is amazing. We can put this in the show, and it is in the show. So anyone who wants to come see this amazing book that <laughs> Carlos found and we managed to track down to a German dealer um, and get for the exhibition is in the exhibition. It arrived. I didn't think about anything and I opened it up. My husband walks into the room and is looking at me in horror because he's like, you should have left that for another two weeks. You don't understand COVID is coming through the mail, you know, or something of this end because, because of the stories that are going out. But it's also like, it made me start to think that, you know, we're talking about the comfort of objects, right? And the way that these kind of tacit boundaries of us communing, coming together, but what happens in a moment of crisis or in a moment when we don't know enough about the viral or the virus and suddenly objects that we love and adore also become dangerous, you know? So I think that that also opens mm -hmm. up a very different dimension to the way in which that we have been talking about objects and we've been talking about care and the way we've been talking mm -hmm. about international and engaging about working together um, and I, I think I'd leave that antidote there. And the last minor, minor thing I'll mention is that, and Carlos can comment on this, but I feel like because of COVID, we've been forced to work more digitally, but we've actually been forced to work collaboratively in a way that I feel that we, you know, in the art world, we talk about collaboration, international collaboration all the time, but I don't think that we have been as generous as we have been as collaborators till sort of the COVID situation forces us to put so much trust in one another, right? Because you can mm -hmm. fly out, you can work things out. But here, you know, Carlos and I are installing through like WhatsApp, FaceTime, you know, and, and there's a certain sense that you can't translate a space and, there, and there's a desire to actually make the time to talk through small decisions with each other and creating that. And that creates a certain level of trust that I feel like I have a deeper relationship collaborating with Carlos than I would if Carlos, you flew out to Singapore, you know, and we put up <laughs> together. So, I mean, I, I just want to throw that because I do think that these are the software parts uh, that are maybe being shifted by um, what the pandemic means specifically, but also broadly, mm -hmm. the whole idea of the glitch of going back to the normal. I just think in, there is an opportunity here if we have the right kind of, if we, if we change our perspective or use multiple perspectives that we can start to think through actually maybe the systematic issues that we've been accepting for a very, very long time. Yeah, so thinking, I think that um, we align in, with, uh, Kath and I align in so many ways um, with her responses, but I think um, thinking alongside what she just said I think there's also productivity in um, thinking about what persists and what thrives in the current situation we're in. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm quite uneasy with how we fetishize maybe is a word, the radicality of the break or the glitch. Because um, as Kat mentioned, these are systemic conditions um, that have been there for quite some time. We can talk mm -hmm. about um, colonialism. We can talk about neo-colonialism. We can talk about um, all these things that are not, I don't think um, we can account for um, compellingly just by fetishizing a radical break or a glitch or um, something like that. So I think the historical is, one of, um, I think the historical for this exhibition is one of um, those uh, ideas that um, we really um, became atten attentive to. And also the idea of a physical exhibition perversely, um, mm -hmm. how will the exhibitionary or the curatorial survive, persist in this current situation? So I think there's also um, productivity in looking at those things and not just this avowing from how we used to um, do things before. Because definitely there is um, intelligence um, in how things are persisting or things are thriving. But if I can add a couple of sentences on what Kathleen said before on, on the maybe transformation of the role of objects. 
uh, I think that's that's like a, a central a core interest for me to look at somehow. Yeah, we have lost uh, maybe that same relationship that we had before, that sort of fetishistic relationship to object that, yeah, are reassuring, they're filling up our sort of uh, uh, social, cultural, spatial, temporal kind of dimension. But maybe <clears throat> one possibility we have is to stop looking at, uh, at in particular, the art objects as that sort of uh, um, embodiment of, uh, of a desire to hold on, to, to, to extract, to, to possess. Somehow, maybe to me, the potential is to think, to start thinking of uh, a different kind of objects. Somehow, like objects that are more on as construction of concept, perhaps. Those are transformative elements that are, that potentially can act within any system, digital or, or, or analog. Somehow, so that that sort of uh, these new modes of collaboration and production exposes us to the possibility of uh, of uh, uh, programmatic rewiring of uh, of maybe re, re in, of maybe finding novel ways of rechanneling what I I think techniques always has because bottom down is that is the mediation of techniques and. And it's the mediation of techni techniques that is always twofold, is a, is a sort of uh, emancipatory, is uh, liberating, and at the same time, is a, it creates a new form of entrapment, new form of exploitation. So there is these things that philosopher Bernard Stiegler uh, had in more than one book elaborated upon, on this trying to, to see that sort of continuous unbalancing that techniques, any technical system produces. And perhaps at this stage, we are in the position of, uh, of inventing new form of ob objecthood. Because if you look at the, the artwork particularly, you see that within the pandemic has been like an incremental production of uh, crypto art. So like from what it was before, there was the creation of material object and the speculation and the capitalization of art object as as the capital embodiment for future kind of speculation, now has been translated into <clears throat> crypto blockchain-based form of exchange. So I think this is critical for any art practice or curatorial practice. Uh, is a critical field to look into. Is a tendency already. So we should ask ourselves perhaps why the necessity of uh, of possessing digital kind of form of creation. Of course. There is also the positive side of it that with blockchain we can liberate new form of uh, uh, let's say redistribution of, uh, of, of of finances to the producer uh, it allows much more dispersed and collaborative form of practices and so on and so forth but it's a twofold knot that always swing back and forth in any sort of uh, technical sort of uh, driven sort of uh, uh, leap and and covid and the pandemic exaggerated, exponentiated this sort of uh, transformation. I think, yeah, that for me, the radical question is to, to try to find or formulate a new form of art object group, not anymore seeing those final kind of uh, uh, concretion, but trying to look for modes of uh, collaborative creation. For me, those are the object that I'm looking for, for to experiment with. Um, I'd like to respond to what Kathleen, Kath, um, Kathleen and Carlos were saying, uh, you know, regarding, you know, towards the, the area of like systems and also like to what we were saying too with glitches um, and history. Um, and I think like one of the things that, um, you know, for example, you know, to speak about Morikana that's made aware is like, like looking beyond this metaphor I'm borrowing from seeing is like looking beyond the plantation and like looking beyond that sort of system um, and into, you know, the jungle, so to speak, because like within within history, there's already embedded futures. It's just the, you know, you know, it's just that those futures are not diffused or revealed. Um, and I think, you know, speaking towards uh, Carlos and Kathleen, um, you know, like the, the ideas of solidarity or formation, you know, like they do seem like new concepts as time rolls around, but um, 
they've already been embedded, just like, um, you know, perhaps like the future that we're experiencing right now already did exist, but it wasn't in, like it wasn't diffused in terms of uh, biosecurity measures and uh, like factoring existential risk for for what's going on right now. So actually, it's sort of a, a question towards Carlos and Kathleen. Um, you know, and I haven't really seen or experienced your exhibition, but just from what I've heard from you, what you guys are speaking, uh, like what what sort of forms of solidarity beyond the nation state do you look at? I mean, you mentioned geographic. Something that I'm dealing with is I try to look at myself from a climatic uh, climatic identity because I grew up in Singapore, but I'm half Filipino, and it's just way easier for me to look at myself you know, hence the word, hence tropical creatures. So I, my question just to rephrase is just like, what other forms of solidarity are you guys envisioning um, around your exhibition beyond the nation state? Could I just add that uh, we'll probably have to close after this response from oh. Jacqueline and Carlos. Um, Carlos, do you wanna, do you wanna respond? Or maybe uh, can, I can choose one moment and then you can choose another. Um, okay. So uh, and sorry to jump ahead, but this is a question actually, um, Christopher, thank you so much for it because it's something that Carlos and I have been wrestling with and we have different perspectives coming from our different research positions. Um, but one of the things that we try to do with the show is to really challenge the idea of solidarity um, and the idea, sorry, more like the idealism of solidarity and to show its limitations and to show the pragmatism in solidarity. The, the best kind of solidarities come from positions of understanding what best interests are and to understand that these are not total systems, right? And we really look at a period when historically the world is going through a shift. We're talking about recently after World War II, the major shift obviously at this moment is international relations before is, is based on the idea of imperialism and basically racial subjugation and a logic of that. Um, and then we see this transition to the rise of the nation state after, but before the nation state as a, as a post-colonial entity, right? Becomes one that becomes a, um, a mo no deal of power or, or or an agent itself that can function, right? Um, it has to overcome the system. And, and in that moment, there's a lot of dreaming beyond the nation state, beyond, um, you know, we, we can talk about it in relation to the color line, but even, you know, the minute that comes into discourse, we have a moment in the exhibition that um, is really about the contestation between Richard Wright and a number of Indonesian um, writers that confront uh, that he he spent time with when he was at the Bandung conference and then later wrote the color curtain and basically there are different um, perspectives on this and one of the things about and one of the things they say about Richard Wright is he has a very colored lens right and that this is not really applied so much to um, our Indonesian political context I mean this is a this is a paraphrasing of a quote and some material that's in the exhibition and so to answer you um, the exhibition covers a number of different moments, right? Where first th there is a sort of the broad idea of co what a color color is and color line is, right? And this you can sort of, it's not related right now. The thing is we get asked this a lot, like does this, is your interest in this because of um, the importance and urgency of Black Lives Matter now and how that's resonated around the world? The answer is yes and no. Um, there are legacies that go from this, but we're not directly responding to that. And so one of the things that we look at is this concept of color, but color being an idea of responding to co colonialism as a history and sharing a kind of solidarity that we have to unburden that history. Now that's one. The second one that is part of this uh, and which is historically located um, and is in the archival material in the exhibition is that a lot of these solidarities were about creating common markets markets that were not based on a, a Western neo-colonialism. Um, and so, okay, I've basically given you two examples, which are basically pragmatic historical examples that we're looking at in terms of where does solidarity come from and where does that idea come from in the specific 50s, 60s. But in the contemporary artworks that we show, one of the things are um, song becomes a moment in which the appropriation of popular song becomes a way of 
aligning oneself to a certain identity, but then also using that identity to speak to one's sort of own marginalized position or one's own suppression within a larger global um, capitalism, uh, cap capitalism context. And I guess this is the moment where the true speculation comes out in the exhibition format is that we're talking about historical material, we're talking about contemporary material, and we're literally making these speculative le leaps across history and connecting these as the reds of moments of ideas of solidarity coming out. Um, so I'm sorry, I know that's three different points, but I felt like I needed to interlink them a bit to kind of flesh out some of the elements. Um, Carlos, do you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, um, whereas Kath mentioned the pragmatism of solidarity, um, for me, I was interested in how it is fictive and how it is poetic. and how that can be simultaneously read into the pragmatism that Kath just mentioned. For example, um, Mafilindo, the, the confederation that we, we talk about in the exhibition, um, is based on um, Malayan exceptionalism, like the Malayan ethnos as um, something exceptional in history. Um, and sure, the period also saw um, like uh, border conflicts, um, antagonisms, annexations in that um, region itself, the Mafilindo region, Malaysia, uh, Malaya, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Um, but there is a historical line that we can trace in relation to how these are imagined. And I think I'm interested in that because it complicates our, our idea of solidarity in ways that we do not consider now. Like it's easy to account for, for example, um, that these are neo-colonial baggages, these are imperial relationships at work. Um, but I think this period is exceptional because simultaneously people are imagining this community, this commonality, um, while um, things that are against it are happening things that will prove otherwise are happening. So um, to speak to your question about other ways of um, imagining solidarity, maybe it's not other ways of imagining solidarity, but imagining solidarity more sensitively in relation to how people agentively um, inserted themselves to history, inserted themselves into these kinds of communities and commonalities um, while the neo-colonial and the colonial um, uh, encumbrances, burdens um, persist. So I think um, that is where we, the, the exhibition comes through because we, we simultaneously account for how this, these, are, these may be pragmatic examples of solidarity, but then how do we account for the dreaming, the idealization, the aspirations that are um, involved in these imaginations? So I think um, that will tell us a lot more about um, how solidarity works. And I guess that's my interest in the idea, even of the idea of Southeast Asia or ideas of regions in general. So how do we um, consider how do we recon um, these simultaneous vectors that move us towards and away from one another. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and on that note, I have to uh, draw the round table to a close. So thank you to all our speakers, Eric, Carlos, Federico, Kat, uh, Chris. Thank you so much. And a big thank you also to our audiences uh, joining us from home or on the go. And please, for more information on exhibitions and programs or please, uh, that, that our speakers have been working on, please go to novelwaysofbeing.sg. And uh, finally, please do take 30 seconds to leave your feedback on today's program by scanning the QR code that will be appearing on screen after this. We would love to hear from you. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Thanks, bye.